I am Stuart Brand from Long Now. <clears throat> you know, all of the great roads in history probably have a Long Now story. Um, a little context, the great roads of empire, the uh, Roman roads were several hundred thousand miles of roads in Italy and Europe. 50,000 miles were paved. Then you get the Inca roads going the entire west coast of South America, 24,000 miles, a lot of it through insane mountains. Just a couple miles east of here, the Spanish Empire had the El Camino Real connecting the 21 uh, missions here in California, 600 miles. As the American Empire started to build, you got the Natchez Trace, uh, which went from the eastern states down to the lower Mississippi, 440 miles. You had the Santa Fe Trail going 900 miles from the Missouri River uh, down to Santa Fe. And then you have some of the sacred pilgrimage paths, which I think are really interesting. The El Camino de Santiago, which goes from France to far northwestern Spain, is 500 miles. Kevin Kelly, you're walking part of that this summer. All right. <laughs> Several hundred thousand people are doing that one now every year. I'd like to see us <clears throat> have a pilgrimage path from the clock we're installing in West Texas to our clock site in eastern Nevada. That would be a thousand miles across <laughs> America's empty quarter, which looks a lot like what you just saw in the long short, and nobody goes there. But the most important of all of the roads went between empires. And it was consequential for at least 2,000 years. And that's the Silk Road, which went 4,700 miles from China to Europe, and Europe to China. And the expert on that is our speaker, <clears throat> Michael Frischetti. Welcome. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to Stuart Brand, all the organizers and members and founders of The Long Now. Uh, what an exciting community of people to be able to both join in with and think with about uh, our civilization over an extended period of time. Um, I'm an archaeologist, and so for me, the concept of long-term thinking is inherent in everything I possibly do. right? Uh, the notion that folks who don't dig things out of the ground are actually paying attention to 10,000 years of human existence is both encouraging because, you know, not, there's not that many jobs out there for archaeologists. <laughs> um, so, you know, anybody who has a multi-billion dollar company and you need an archaeologist on staff, please let me know. No, I'm, I'm actually still game. I actually am game. Well, it's okay. Um, what I want to do tonight is from the lens of an archaeologist, someone who actually digs things out of the ground and who um, tries to interpret those things with that long chronological lens, um, I want to talk to you about this concept of civilization that we use so colloquial, colloquially, and yet we, we very rarely um, critique in the sense of what it actually means. Um, most archaeologists even shy away from the term because it's loaded with lots of uh, ideas that maybe would seem outdated or something. But in our common parlance, it's definitely part of our everyday life. We think about it when we, think of, when, when we uh, consider very, very contemporary issues like war and uh, progress and development and whether we're going to send money to help a community that's been ravaged by a uh, hurricane. So I'm going to take you on a journey today, effectively across the Silk Roads. And my uh, point tonight will be to kind of illustrate that civilization isn't necessarily what you think it is. And hopefully give you some real science underneath why I think it might be something else. And then we'll, we'll end up with a uh, sort of provocative uh, proposition about maybe where we should go in the future. Uh, because as we know, this is really what the long now is about. <laughs> um, so, my title. Um, I'm not blind to the idea that I'm in Silicon Valley, or at least in the Bay Area, uh, and yet the, same, the notion of an open source civilization, a civilization that isn't bounded, but is in fact uh, a wiki civilization, a civilization in which input is flexible, boundaries are open, 
This is the idea that I want to start with, and I want to juxtapose that, in a sense, to this model of civilization. This is an image I took from an airplane window uh, in 2016 as I was flying into Urumqi, China. This is the westernmost province of China, Xinjiang, uh, the New Lands. And uh, what, I, I, mean, I hope it's evident here, this isn't the city center. This is the city periphery. This is the growth of Chinese civilization today in its desertmost city. Right? It's, it's northern, it's on the edge of the Gobi, on the edge of the Takumakan Desert, just north of the, of the Tarim, or sorry, the uh, Tian Shan Mountains. And you see multi million individuals living in this city. And this city was founded by the Tang Dynasty, okay, at the time of the height of the Silk Road, 7th century. This is a city that acted as part of a trade network. And while, yes, I would argue that this was a network that linked civilizations, there's no questions, question, I would argue that, in fact, I am going to show you, in fact, that it derived from a civilization. It derives from its own source of a civilization that looks something more like this. Now, you might say that's impossible. There's no cities here. There's no there's nothing. This is just an open grassland, very much like the images you saw in the long short. And so this is, we have a long way to go between this, you know, the start of our, our concept of civilization and getting here. But before we delve into that, I need, to do some, some, uh, I need to do some shopkeeping here. I, you know, I, I've never really spent much time on the West Coast. I did have a sabbatical at UCLA, but I'm from New York. I grew up on the East Coast. I live in St. Louis now at Washington, I'm at Washington University. I'm used to kind of hanging around with stuffy academic types. So I wasn't really sure uh, what to wear. Uh, so I consulted what I could only imagine as an outsider was some sort of obscure gray literature and found that, in fact, there was a guide. <laughs> now, you might you know, chuckle, and I apologize here to the, to the ladies in the room. I initially took in all possibilities, but uh, resolved on, on the uh, at least male-gendered uh, attire. I couldn't really find any of these appropriate to me, but I did find one unifying characteristic. Everyone's wearing pants. <laughs> now, it's a little bit hard for me to see, so I apologize. But, and I don't normally ask the car, for any crowd participation. I know it's very, it's actually a faux pas when giving kind of a public lecture. <laughs> but I want, by a show of hands, anyone who is wearing two-legged pants today to raise their hand. <laughs> now, I want everyone in the front here to turn back and look. And keep your hands up for a second. Now, I'm no mathematician, although I do have a degree. Uh, and I think it's about 98% of you who are wearing pants. And so allow me a mild digression as we explore pants. Now, it's not for nothing that Levi Strauss was here in San Francisco. I mean, I use this as an example. And in fact, these are the oldest known pants, or the oldest known jeans found somehow. I guess you can go to the Levi Strauss Museum and find these historical pants like in their you know, to, you know, factory tour or what have you. They, they apparently were washed up in some cave, and they were bundled and things, and they had them on display. And what I love is, the, is these vintage, I googled vintage Levi's advertisements, and there's some really beautiful ones if you really want to delve into it. But what was coinciding with all of them was, first of all, okay, this is, relates back to the techies, I think, is you know, the farmers, mechanics, and miners. I'm kind of seeing the similarities there between techies and farmers and miners, maybe not. Um, cowboys, cowgirls, you know, Levi's is very egalitarian. They always have females and males both riding around on horses wearing their lovely jeans. And yet, this is really the message, right? That Levi's and jeans and pants are as west as you can get, as western as you can get. Now you might say, where are you going with this, Freshetti? This is not a trivial point. The notion of pants as a symbol of modernity, of the West, of progress, and of civilization, we can go back to the 19th century and find very serious and important moments in, historical, in the historical trajectory, where, for example, the emperor of Japan in the 19th century, the Meiji emperor, whose goal was to modernize Japan in the eyes of the world, demanded that his courtiers, the men and the women in his court, dressed in Western dress. He abandoned kimonos, he banned samurai swords. You've all seen the Tom Cruise movie. <laughs> but this is a real thing, right? And you can see it here depicted in this fabulous ukiyo-e. 
Today, we're not struggling with whether civilization is represented by pants. We're struggling with whether civilization is represented by a burqa. Um, this is a beautiful piece of street art in Paris, I believe, reflecting the Muslim population of Paris and the contentiousness that the burqa or the hijab has for the concept of Western progress. And this isn't just sort of anecdotal. In fact, one of my colleagues at Washington University, John Bowen, has written extensively on this topic. This is an entire book about the state and institutional laws and rules that underlie this strict bias. And this puts, us, puts our minds in a challenging position, a polarized position, because we say, but I'm a feminist, right? I mean, I could have easily worn my, my shirt that said, in fact, my, my partner has a wonderful shirt that says, I'm feminist as hell. And yet, we're challenged by this idea that someone should express their civilization in the way that they choose. It extends beyond that, as we struggle with the way in which clothing and attire and personality is reflected in things like turbans, and the sort of profiling that occurs, for example, when we wear a turban, and we, if I were to wear a turban and grow my beard out, would I be stopped at the, at the airport? We associate it with these Taliban or Pashtuns, right? We have these very cloudy, sort of fuzzy boundaries about what people wear and how it gets translated into our notions of modernity. And again, we see examples, for example, the Madras army, these are Sikhs, I believe, who were forced to wear European clothes to be part of the East India Company. This is where the irony comes around. Where do the oldest known pants come from? It's not England, it's not France, it's not Italy. But in fact, the oldest known pants archaeologically come from the Silk Road. Unsurprisingly, because when you ride horses all the time, just like the Levi's say, you want to have a comfortable pair of pants. And here you see this pristinely preserved horse rider in his uh, shallow grave with the aridity of the Taklamakan Desert here in Turfan, preserving none other than the world's oldest pants. And these date to about 3,000 years ago. You can see them today in Urumqi, ironically enough, in that, in that city with the towering uh, expansion. You can find those pants in the museum there. I'll come back to these later in the lecture. Let's first take a look at the Silk Road, because that's really why you're here. The pants are an entry point for us to understand that the Silk Road was a mechanism by which not only culture and society was translated, but in fact, civilization was translated. And what I want to convince you of, it is not necessarily the translation of East Asia to Southwest Asia or Europe to, to China, but in fact, it was the translation of a civilization that is open and connected across that territory that evolved out of, out of a time scale that was even greater than 2,000 years. Stuart asked me, at the beginning to clarify exactly how many years we can sort of count the Silk Road as an existing thing. And I said, eh, as I, you know, a classic academic, eh, kind of, sort of, depends on what you, know, what you believe is the start of it. And I'm going to try to convince you that it goes back more than 2,000. 2,000 is a safe number. I'm going to convince you that it goes back 4,000 years. And as long-term thinkers, I think none of you will have a too big of a problem with that. But what bothers me more about this map is not the uh, sort of depiction of the, of the Silk Roads as connecting cities, per se, but as single roads. And what you'll see as I develop uh, through the lecture, you'll note that, in fact, the Silk Roads were not a single road, but were, in fact, thousands, if not tens of thousands, of short networks of communication. And it's at this point that we find the connectivity with the notion of open source. So what we're really utilizing here is the, is the capacity for networks to illustrate something about civilization, rather than the metrics of progress, such as cities, agriculture, irrigation, you know, et cetera. <clears throat> we also have to discuss a little bit about history, because, of course, our notions of nomadic societies and of Central Asia come from historical documentation, largely. So here, for example, you see some artifacts. In the, in the top of the page, you see um, two golden artifacts. Uh, one is a golden comb, not much larger than my hand, and the other one is a golden torque to be worn around the neck. And depicted in those golden artifacts are Scythian nomads. These are nomads of about the first millennium BCE. 
uh, mid-first millennium, they were a dominant community that lived across the entirety of the Eurasian steppe. And they were met on their southern boundaries by the Hellenistic world and by China in the east. Um, here you see the campaigns of Alexander the Great at roughly the same time period. And what's interesting about these sort of juxtaposition of these two uh, artifacts is that in the, in the golden artifact, you see a Scythian warrior wearing pants, driving his spear into this fallen horse, depicting this sort of battle scene. And of course, this is how Herodotus describes the Scythians, right? Herodotus describes them as landless, as knowing no agriculture, as chopping the heads off their enemies and dangling them from the, from the, from the, uh, uh, the bits of their horses. Sima Qian and, and, and historians of the Han Dynasty refer to the Xiongnu and the, the eastern nomadic communities of Mongolia as you know, the fiercest warriors that they've ever encountered. On the lower panel, you see, in fact, Alexander with his lion's crown attacking Persians in this case. And you see the Persians also wearing sort of pants. Alexander does not wear pants. Alexander's wearing a tunic because pants hadn't come to Europe yet. And yet, the synergy, or the, say, the, the, assimil the assimilation between the two images is, un is remarkable. The golden piece was carved by Greeks as a trade tribute for the, for, the, uh, for the Scythians. They were actually in quite close interaction. This notion of a boundary between the two of them is probably overstated, as shown by trade items and the craftsmanship that goes into these tribute items that were paid to the Scythians. In fact, the, the uh, relief on the bottom is from a 4th century AD, 4th century CE sarcophagus reflecting almost the exact same scene, in this case, recrafted to honor uh, Alexander himself. So it's this historical perspective, in a way, that has cast, has sort of ignored the fact that pants come from Central Asia and pants come from the Silk Road and all the markers that we have of modernity and, 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 and progress, in many cases, have earlier and different origins. And that's what I'm going to illustrate to you as much, as much as possible tonight. And we trade them for this historical idea of nomadic societies as violent, barbaric, landless, tribal, very many of the same kind of words that we hear thrown about for, for, for the barbarians of our world today, the folks that we see as other. And it's this image that has left archaeologists out of this region. So when we look at the cradles of civilization that we know today, as historians and as archaeologists, we don't think about the middle parts of Asia. We think about these places, the Aegean, Egypt, Sumeria, the Indus Valley in China. This is just in the old world. It could include, of course, new world examples. But what's similar about all of these? They're all urban, agricultural, riverine. These are the path dependencies that carry through our notion of civilization to this day. So what comes from this region? That was where I was 25 years ago, when I first started working in this part of the world. I didn't actually know. It was held back from us largely because of the Soviet Union. We were unable to work in many of those stand countries, right? Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, etc. And so our notion of civilization is not created for those places. We actually don't have a narrative. And that's part of what I'm here to uh, bring to you tonight, and also to help then relate that to where we are today and where we're going. So let's first talk a little bit about that old model of civilization. And I want to problematize it. So these are some interesting images. Um, these are satellite images of borders. So the northern, in the upper panel, you see China and Kazakhstan, uh, where you see on the right-hand side of your uh, vision the agricultural fields and development of China. On the left hand, the natural, so to speak, deserts of, of Kazakhstan, which you just saw in the long, in the long short. And of course, the US-Mexican border. Again, these dynamic polarities. And what these polarities illustrate from the concept of civilization are quite, the, the, the tendencies are quite deep in, in our vision of the world. One is core and periphery. We're the center of civilization, they're the periphery. Right? This is why you know, Sasha Baron Cohen in the, in, the, in the early 90s can make a stupid movie about Kazakhstan because who cares? They're only the seventh largest uh, oil producers in the world, they only have the fourth or fifth largest landmass, they're nobody. There's only 15 million of them. We have that in Brooklyn now. Most of them are hipsters. <laughs> so core periphery is a really key thing for us to challenge when we start to think about what drives the Silk Road. Is it the Chinese driving the Silk Road? 
Or was it these peripheral regions that maybe had more influence? Globalized and local. We're globalized. We speak languages. I have shoes imported from Italy. They're not really. I, got them. I don't even know. <laughs> I just try and, I mean, I really try to do a reshop for the techie thing. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's this notion that, that globalization is available to those with power, and everybody else is the recipient of it. We can take Africa, I think, as the best example of this today. We, we, we see Africa today as this kind of peripheral region that needs our help. They're engaged, and they have been engaged in globalization for millennia, I promise you. And we're actually about to publish a book with one of my colleagues called uh, Prehistoric Globalization, where we're actually showing so many of these inroads into Africa thousands and thousands of years ago. Civilized and barbarian, I've already covered that to a certain extent, this notion that pastoralists and the peripheries are these kinds of you know, populations without any sensibilities and without any kind of contribution to where we live and how we live. And of course, urban and rural, or urban and undeveloped. And these are some ideas that I want to challenge tonight. The classic examples of these also bring up some important concepts that bring us to sort of a sci-fi perspective of the world today, and that is, which of these two worlds is the more utopian? I recently reread Sir Thomas More's book, Utopia, which was part of a side project that I'm working on, on utopia dystopia as a juxtaposition. And what I realized was that all of these constructions, the Great Wall of China, in a lot, in a lot of ways, you know, we, we understand it as you know, the wall that separates the barbarians from the empire of China. So who creates that boundary? Who creates that wall and says, inside is utopia, outside is dystopia? Inside the walls of Uruk is the cosmology of the city. Outside is periphery. And these boundaries are the things that, again, I want to challenge with the idea of mobility and nomadism and the way in which these populations that didn't construct cities and didn't, for thousands of years, participate in the very basic rudiments of civilization that we understand generally, when I say we, I mean Western, uh, that in fact, we have to kind of begin to rethink this whole thing. So one way of rethinking it is to use this model of open source, open network, or what I call an open ecumen. Now, Ecumen is a weird word, and I've struggled with it with my editors and with my colleagues, because it's not, it doesn't roll off the tongue, right? I mean, open source does. Uh, open ecumen comes from the Greek word oikumene, which just means world, the known world, which actually, interestingly, comes from the base word oikos, which is just a word for home, which I'll get, I'll get to in the very end of my lecture, like the very last slide. The open ecumen, though, which is kind of the modernized American version of the word oikumene, because who's going to walk around saying oikumene? Uh, is this concept that worlds are created not as static, progressive units that go from small to large, you know, small scale to large scale, organized or disorganized to organized, bands to tribes, to chiefs and to states, but in fact that worlds are created by this open process within which information flows, information dies, information gets animated, information gets redeployed, right? This is how networks function. I don't need to tell you guys. And interestingly enough, this image, adapted from a, a woman I found on the internet, a scholar called Diane Klein, shows the very same empire of Alexander the Great as mapped vis-a-vis -vis his historical networks. I just think it's a beautiful image, and she maps it across her work in so many different ways, and it allows us to start to realize how permeable this notion of an empire could actually be. Maybe empires aren't these solid state controlled hegemonies. Maybe, in fact, they're far more permeable and mosaic than we give them credit for, or than we over-credit over them for. So this is my last sort of slide on civilizations. What I want to propose to you tonight is to somewhat step away from this old model of civilization, which is, I think, I think quite rigid, quite unsustainable in some ways. State-based markets, urban, settled, territorial, <laughs> imperial, colonial economies, and hegem hegemonies of ideology and power. Underneath it, you see a ziggurat. So I liked how that played out. On the right, you see the gearworks, which reminded me of the, of the long now clock. This is the turning wheels of, scale, of multiple scales of networks and, and, and intersections. These are the places where, this is the kind of model in which civilization is modular, interoperable. And it can be scaled at different, at different ranges depending on who you're talking to. This is the experiences I have 
living amongst nomads of Central Asia today is that information is permeable and the, the worlds that they create are not necessarily fixed by national boundaries. They're in fact translocal and mobile. So how does this all get started? How do we create a model of an open ecumen? We can't just imagine it, right? There has to be some scientific data to prove that this might even be possible, or at least possible in some places. Now, I'm not going to deny that in Egypt they created a state, or that they created these incredible urban you know, civilizations. Fine. But what about these territories we don't know? What can we say about those? Depicted in this image is a Google Earth kind of uh, three-dimensional view looking eastward uh, from the desert of Lake Balkash, which you'll notice I come back to numerous times. I won't use the pointer too much, but I want to point it out here. This is Lake Balkash, and this is a, a small lake in southeastern Kazakhstan. You'll notice that it's kind of a half crescent. It will keep popping up in the images, so just you can use it as an orientation. Looking from that lake towards China, we're viewing our the, the Jungar Mountains, which rise to about 4,000 meters of elevation. And on the foothills, I've been working for about 20 years. The site of Bigash, I'll be talking a lot about. It's a small little campsite. I'll take you there in a minute. And the sites of Dali and Tazbas, two other small campsites, all of which date to about 5,000 years ago. This is where we're going to be uh, spending a little bit of time to look at the archaeology. Before we get into the sites, I want to give you a brief orientation to the geography, because the geography and environment and ecology of this region is fundamental to how we understand the, ad the adaptiveness of these populations. You might wonder, well, why don't they build cities? Why didn't they pass through these stages of development like we see, for example, in Mesopotamia or the Yellow River Valley? Well, part of it is because it's desert and grassland. What you saw in that long, short video, which was really ideal for this lecture, because it brought to life that really extreme and and difficult environmental scope. And you see how far and how distant those, across territory, those landscapes extend. They go from the Iranian plateau all the way basically to the, to the forests of Siberia. And it's desert and grass and desert and grass and mountains and desert and mountains and grass. And it, you don't get that many opportunities to really settle down and plant. The soils aren't as good. The, the climate is extremely continental. It's freezing in the winter and boiling in the summer. It's great. This is a more realistic image in terms of the actual grass cover. And what you can see here is an interesting band of, of territory running kind of on this, between the two uh, stars. The green at the top is the Eurasian grasslands. And I'm not going to spend too much time on that area because it's not really where the Silk Roads run. In fact, this is one of the big discoveries in a lot of ways, is that the Silk Roads mimic and run along the grass foothills that extend along the mountains of Inner Asia. And those are the mountains that go from northern Afghanistan into Tajikistan, to Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, and ultimately into southern Russia, over a number of different ranges. It's essentially an extension of the Himalayas as they arc around the western fringe of the border of China. In the area where I've been working, again, keying in on that, on that crescent lake, you can see here from a satellite image the range of habitats you go from, within the span of only 300 kilometers, you go from sand dunes to glaciers. And this is a really uh, convenient laboratory for understanding how human adaptation fits in with uh, social change, because we can actually relate the grasslands and the deserts to this exp expansive uh, environment. Another way of viewing it is through rainfall. So the image here in blue is the same territory, in this case related to the wettest quarter of rainfall throughout the year. So about you know, one quarter of the year, you get the most rain in that blue band. You'll notice that humongous yellow zone in the middle, that's mostly desert and arid grassland. So of course, when we think about the way in which nomadic systems evolve, meaning herding and pastoralist systems, we have to relate those back to this rainfall map. In the northern part of the Eurasian steppe, we have large-bodied domestic animals, cattle and horse, that take advantage of the seasonality of that grassland shift. So in the wintertime, the south becomes habitable. You get a little bit more moisture. Folks can go move to the south, trans, um, you know, trans, uh, or mob, uh, migrate to the south in order to sort of take advantage of those southern grasses. And then in the summer when it warms up and Siberia kind of starts to melt, they move right up to the fringe of the, desert, or, or fringe of the forest, and those larger-bodied uh, mammals, like horses and cattle, do better. So you'll notice here that the animals are sized according to their importance within each one of those regional economies. 
in prehistory. Where I work, in an area which I've called the Inner Asian Mountain Corridor, that linking territory that runs east to west and north to south along the Inner Asian Mountains, the adapt adaptation is a little bit different. Here you're in ele elevation systems, you do have arid systems, but you also have rockier and grassier environments. And so sheep play a big role, and I want to focus on sheep because they'll come, become important in the latter stages of this lecture. But I also want to focus on the icon there of the wheat grain. This is also the only territory of the northern Eurasian region where we see the development of farming along with mobile herding. So in those other regions, it eventually gets there, but not until roughly the first millennium BC. Farming, moving up this mountain corridor, is an important aspect of understanding the very first connectivity that we might think of as the Silk Road. And I'm going to take you there. First, we need to see, however, how that mobility functions and establish in our minds what this mobility pattern, seasonal and annual mobility, looks like for these nomadic communities. The long lines going north and south illustrate just what I was talking about. The, south, the, the winter pastures in the south, the summer pastures in the north, and those vast longitudinal lines can extend sometimes over 500 to 800 kilometers. However, if you look towards the southern and eastern ranges, in this case of Kazakhstan, along that mountain corridor, you see that the, mount, that the, that the pathways are shortened. And those shorter pathways are key to what we're going to talk about because it's a question of frequency. When you make long, drawn-out migrations, you have less frequency for contact. But when you have short migrations and they're limited by territory, like mountains, you have greater frequency of contact. And it's that exact model, this idea of utilizing rich highland pastures in juxtaposition to comfortable winter locations in the lowlands that creates the network. And this is how the networks start to form. Now, this is pretty old work for me, honestly. This is my dissertation work 20-some years ago, 24 years ago. But the ability to take this model and apply it at a large scale Actually, we couldn't do it in the, in the, in the late 90s. We didn't have, I mean, maybe you had the computing power. I certainly didn't, to be able to run this model over vast territory at high resolution. And so this network crea creates, and this creation of a network between mobile communities is what we want to then understand as a potential, for, as a formative uh, a device or a formative mechanism by which connectivity and the acumen start to take form. So how do we understand this from, first, from an archaeological perspective? So pre modeling. Let's zoom into one of this, those little red dots, one of those, those sites that we actually located. Um, the site of Bigash is one of the places where I've worked for a very, very long time. And uh, the site itself is very small. It lasted 4,000 years. So talk about a long now scenario. This is a small campsite about the size of this flat part of the stage here. Not much bigger. And there's 4,000 years of occupation. The Roman Empire, 900, 800 years. The Mongols, about 300. Bigash, a little tiny site, looks kind of like this. No empire there. But this site sustained for 4,000 years. We see the different levels here. I just want to give you a sense of what the archaeology looks like. But perhaps more important than the excavation is this continuity and economy. Here you see the the food that they ate, the animals that they were eating throughout 4,000 years of occupation. It's basically unchanging. Now, it doesn't mean that the societies didn't change. They did. They, they, they changed in technology. They changed in their uh, development of contacts, et cetera. And I'll show you some of that in a second. But the rudiment of their life, the basic way that they survived, was by moving their animals up and down hillsides and eating sheep, goat, and cattle and, some, and riding horses. In the site of Bigash, at the site of Bigash, in addition to all that sort of boring archaeology, collecting sticks and stones and rocks and ceramics, we found this wonderful little preserved grave. In that grave were human remains, cremated around, four, around 2,200 BC, about 4,000 some odd years ago. And in the sediments of that soil, we found the earliest known grains for this region. And those grains were of two different kinds, wheat on the one hand and millet on the other. Now, how many people had millet for breakfast? Anybody even had millet? Okay, good. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like I have like a millet bar in my pocket right now. <clears throat> millet is one of the most important grains for East Asia. It was first domesticated in China, and it was the, the staple crop before rice for most of East Asia. It's the earliest domesticated in China, which is little known. 
In addition to Bigash, we've done more work, right? And we found yet another one of these little stone boxes with yet another uh, burned and cremated body with yet another round of seeds. So this is a trend. In this early stage, around 2,500 BC, 4,500 years ago, people were burning bodies and either putting seeds into their ceremony or those seeds were somehow with the individuals and we get them through the flotation process and we have these little charred grains and we can date them and we now know that the earliest farmers in these regions were in fact nomads. Wait a minute, how can that be? I once had a scholar at, at, at Berkeley uh, say to me, I showed him some ceramics. I said, these are nomadic ceramics. He said, nomads don't have ceramics. And I said, no, they do. And he said, no, they're nomads. By definition, they can't have ceramics. I'm going to show you nomadic cities in a little bit. <laughs> Seriously. In fact, this is that argument I was making about the grain. This is the earliest, quote, evidence for the Silk Road. Now, it's not the Silk Road of that earlier map. It's not an imperial connective network, et cetera. This is the earliest foundations of connectivity between East and West. We have millet and wheat, two domesticates, which start on opposite ends of Asia for the first time and the oldest time, joining here. Oop, wrong direction. There it is, here. Right in the middle of the Inter-Asian Mountain Corridor. And that's the territory that will become the territory of the Silk Road. So you could argue, this is the oldest evidence for the Silk Road. Only in the press, though. <laughs> it's not just grains. By the second millennium BC, we've got a whole variety of objects that are flowing through this inner Asian mountain corridor. Here you see archaeological evidence for burials. And in this case, burials that extend from east to west, very similar, similar kinds of syntax. How do you treat a dead person? If you were to arrive in another country and participate in a, in a, in a ceremony of how to bury a dead body, you need to know what's going on. How are you going to do it right or wrong? These are communities over vast territories that seem to have a similar comprehension of what goes on in the afterlife. I don't call it a religion, but it could be. Remember these? These are interesting because they're pants, but they're also interesting because of how they were made. These are twills. Now, I think I'm wearing a twill. I think a houndstooth is a twill. Jeans are a twill. I'll show you those in a second. Half of you in here are probably wearing a twill. And you might say, who cares? Well, the reason why we have to care about twill is not only because it's a beautiful cloth, but twill is extremely durable. So the reason for making those pants out of twill is because they were horse riders, just like the way in which we make jeans to be durable. In fact, Levi's would have made a lot less money if they had chosen to do a cross stitch. The problem with making a twill is that you have to separate two of the warp, uh, warp um, strings from the weft strings in order to, run the, to get the diagonal pattern that gives you that strength so that it doesn't run down the seam. In fact, you're, this is what gives you that tensile strength. So you need to have a special loom. There's only a couple types of looms that will allow you to do this, and one of them is the two-beam loom. How do you find a loom in archaeology? Well, you find loom weights. And we find some evidence for those two-beam looms. This is some work by uh, one of our uh, a late scholar named Elizabeth Barber, who uh, was a real expert on textiles. And the earliest evidence for the vertical two-beam loom comes out of the Caucasus. And she proposed, in order to link the early evidence for twills with the early evidence for the looms, that it passed across the Eurasian steppe. But now, we have a much better way of understanding how that loom might have connected to the populations who actually needed it most probably through the inner Asian mountain corridor. And here I'm going to take you to some of the evidence, again, from Bigash. Now you might say, how do you find textiles from 5,000 years ago? Especially, you know, in the desert, fine. They're, they're on mummies and things. But how do you find it in these more, you know, well-watered foothill grassland zones? Well, it's a neat little factor. Ceramic, or, uh, textiles are also used to, in the process of molding ceramics. And so we have a whole host of ceramics that have textiles impressed right into the back of them. And we can, with the help of one of my former PhD students, we can make casts of that to get the positive and get really high resolution casts of what the textiles look like. And here you see one of those casts. And in fact, again, because we can lo locate those ceramics in time and in chronology, we can actually give you a history of the textiles as they produced through this simple nomadic campsite. And to draw it all together, the site of Bigash here is one of the earliest known sites in Asia to actually have evidence for a twill. So again, we see this broad connectivity 
in the realm of pants. Last case from prehistory. Let's look at the way in which metals, we all use metal. I mean, everybody in this room is sitting in a metallic building with metallic cars and iron and steel and alloys and all sorts of good stuff. How do networks of metal take shape? When was the last time you went out and dug up a metal? I haven't. Well, actually, I have. But. <laughs> we're going to now go to the site. We're going to go away from Bigash for a while and go over here to this group of sites called, called Dali and Tazbas and look at some of their metallurgical process. So at Dali, we found evidence for both the mining, the smelting, as well as the actual end products, right? The objects that we know of as bronze. And that's cool. Bronze is a, you know, it's the Bronze Age. We expect them to have bronze. <laughs> but what's neat about their bronze is simply that their bronze doesn't come from their own mines. They are, the, the, the objects that they are creating are using ores that don't come from the local mines. So there, there's a network and a circulation of, of metal. So this creates a social world in which metal is a trade object, maybe being used not as a currency, perhaps, but as a proto-currency or as a proto-form of, of, uh, of social payment, of reciprocity. And if we track out those networks using the elements in the metal themselves, this is some shared work with a colleague of mine at Cambridge, we can actually say that in the earliest Bronze Age, you have very localized networks. In the middle Bronze Age, those networks begin to join. And this is using just basic network software. And by the late Bronze Age, you can see the generation of those networks through the material objects themselves. So we don't have to speculate about whether these networks occurred. We know they occurred. And we know those networks occurred as far from Kazakhstan to India at this time. This is 2000 BC, 4,000 years ago. And who cares? So great, they were trading in ores. The Shang Empire, one of the key imperial forces that drives the rise of China, used as its fundamental religious and ideological point of control and, and, and access to, to royalty and elite status, bronze. And where do they get their bronze, their, their bronze technology? It imports from the Northwest, from nomadic technology. This was a huge scandal in China, even as recently as two or three years ago. I mean, I'm serious. We went to conference after conference after conference to show this is how it comes in, the chronology of it, the technology, the alloys. The tin itself has to be imported. So all those big, bad barbarians that were attacking at the fringe, they, the Chinese needed them. They needed them real bad, because the Shang, the Shang dynasty depended on bronze vessels, those beautiful things, to create their ritual economy. Now, what is the impact? If the Bronze Age was the start of the Silk Road, let's say, and I think that we can illustrate that there was a lot of connectivity happening. If that was happening, what is the impact of it? And how, how do we model it? So that network, again, is important. Another way of thinking about this is who was more important, Marco Polo or Xi? Now, I did some technical work. The most, the most difficult part of the project was actually engin genetically engineering tiny sheep to put into a cup to then do some hydrological modeling. What I decided to do, I should go back a slide because I've skipped over it. This image shows about 2,000 sheep flowing across a landscape in Uzbekistan. This is a place where we're digging now. And that flow of sheep gave me an idea. Can we think of sheep like water? How did the flows of animals across this landscape create networks or create points of connectivity? Maybe that year after year after year, that frequency of networks did something special. The, techn the technical details, they're published, you can get them. We basically took lots of variables and we mushed them together, we put them in the computer and kind of smashed it and shook it. And we end up with a simulation that looks like this. Each one of these simulations illustrates a rivulet of sheep each year being a unique rivulet that then forms, and then you iterate that over and over and over again, slightly changing some of the variables, creating diversity in the networks, kind of mimicking the choices that humans make, and the fact that you get in a fight with your brother-in-law, or that the, the, the passageway was, the, the pass over the mountains was closed. Whatever the choices were, you create these diverse pathways, and as you iterate over and over and over again, sometimes they link up, they sort of spark. And that spark can be then accumulated through time. And here's 500 of those iterations, so roughly 500 years worth of slightly changing mobility patterns. 
And just so you can see, this is the whole Silk Road, by the way, or just about. I mean, this is just the part I can show on the screen. It keeps going in the other direction. Here's an even greater detail. 75% of all known Silk Road sites in historical period map onto those predicted routes. So you can basically provide the highest accurate, most accurate map of the Silk Road ever made with 75% accuracy. And that's 10 to the 6 z-score. So we're like 75%, but it's really, really, really good. Um, if you think about the way that map looks, it's not a single highway east to west. This is not a Roman road. This is a dynamic, open network in which populations were interacting and in which that flow of information and technology and all the things that we come to understand as simple and as basic as peaches and pants and gunpowder flowed. And we see the sites right alongside it. Here's the site of Tashrabat, a caravanserai at 3,500 meters. That's like 12,000 something feet. Who builds a hotel at 12,000 feet except for people who own Vail? Is the owner of Vale here? <laughs> Not only do we have sites that we know about that fall along this map, but we actually, in a sense, have a sort of treasure map now to look at places that we didn't expect to look at. And that's one of the most exciting parts. I'm running over time a little bit. I understand that, but hopefully you'll bear with me. I'm almost there. Tashbulak, very famous city. Everyone knows about it. It's like Rome, Cairo, Tashbulak. We found Tashbulak in 2011 using predictive models that were the exact same variables that we used to create the Silk Road map. And in 2011, we went up into the highlands of Uzbekistan, the same exact highlands where you saw those flows of sheep. You were actually looking at the city of Tashbulak. And I want to show it to you here. There it is. You see it kind of right in here. All of this is the city. Now, you might say, this is the, not the kind of city I'm used to seeing. Now, right, here we go. The preliminary work, we have shown that this site was occupied 11, 12 centuries. The walls are on top on the surface, and these are like Karahan period walls, 1,000 years old. Why build a large occupation at 2,100 meters elevation? Why did they live here? How did they live here? And for what? You know, what was the, what was the motivation? As of 2015, this is our third year working at Tashbulak. When we first discovered the site, myself and uh, Farhad Maksudov and a team of archaeologists from the Institute of Archaeology in Uzbekistan, as well as from Washington University in St. Louis, what we thought was here was just a, a number of small habitations. Subsequent research in 2012 and 2013 revealed that this was a much larger place. This is a medieval town or city and a large cemetery associated to the construction. In order to understand the history of this area, uh, of course, we have to do archaeology. It should be a very multidisciplinary project. So the whole real goal this year was to come out with a larger team of specialists and to examine some of the specialized parts of the city, as well as the environmental impact that a city this large would have had on a very precarious environment high in the mountains here in Uzbekistan. I wish I could... Uh spend the entire hour just talking about Tashbulak. It's an amazing location. It's, it's at 2,100 meters elevation. Just by comparison, that's Machu Picchu. The same elevation as Machu Picchu. In fact, it's almost the same size as Machu Picchu. It just doesn't have as beautiful. The llamas aren't anywhere near as beautiful. <laughs> what you're looking at here is an animation of ground-penetrating radar. We've only excavated a very small part of the city so far, yet we understand exactly how big it is, where the walls are, and how it's laid out, simply on the basis of using a radar signal fired into the ground that bounces back anomalies and gives us a very accurate map of what is going on under the surface. This is work done by one of my most stellar colleagues and recent PhD, or about to finish his PhD at Henry, also at Washington University. Um, and what you're seeing here, again, is the emergence of the wall. This is the Citadel Mound. Here's a palace on top of the citadel and the rest of the city. To make this a little bit clearer for you, here you can see again kind of the, oh, and then running down the middle of the site is a, a drainage stream. Um, this city can be kind of understood in this fashion. 
You've got a citadel on top with a palace structure. You've got some workshops, what, it's not what we think is a gatehouse and a gate western town, and um, sort of a territory out here, which is sort of beyond the, the main cluster of the town itself. This is about seven hectares. So a hectare is about the size of a football field. So that's about the size we're talking about. And you might say, well, that's kind of small. It's just a town, right? Well, this place has a cemetery, which, you illustri which is illustrated here. The, the graves don't show up in the radar. They only show up in magnetometry, a, a, a methodological detail. But what you can see here are these little rows of dots. And each one of those dots is a human burial. And there's over 400 of them. So we have 400 buried bodies in a town the size of, like, I don't even know what the best analogy is, Oakland? Not even, like downtown, I don't know, Union Square, I'm not sure. I, I, I shouldn't have even attempted. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from the East Coast. Like, no, I barely know what to, what to wear. <laughs> um, so you might say, well, okay, who are these Karakhanids? Why do we, how does this relate? Right? So you found a city along the Silk Road. It's probably just another Silk Road city. We know about Silk Road cities, 75% of them all on the Silk Road. We got it. Well, this one is unique, or amongst the unique sites we know of, because it belonged to a time period when the Silk Road was controlled by the largest nomadic empire before the Mongols, the Karakhanid Khanate. This was, a con this was a, an aggregate of tribal communities of nomads that decided they, they were tired of having to fight against everybody else, so they got together and created a polity. And that polity had some pretty amazing con consequences. First and foremost, they became not only the traders of, but the purveyors of high carbon steel. Now, high carbon steel is significant because it gives us all of the buildings in San Francisco, it gives us cars, it gives us samurai swords, it gives us basically arms. And when you're in a world in which swords and, and battle axes are your number one arms, having a sword that's a lot better than a piece of, of, of casted iron is really important. How important? Important enough that the Arab armies of the Caliphate in the Near East purchased their swords from Central Asia, and those swords became the very swords that deflected the First Crusaders and won the First Crusade for the Arab armies. High carbon steel has never been unimportant from the day it was uh, invented until now. That economic drive also inspired them to start to participate. Participate in notions of civilization that could in fact be seen as exterior to their nomadic origins. They hired Persian architects and worked with local developers to make mausolea. And, and some of them are quite incredible. These are standing mausolea from the 10th century. Probably built, though, by technicians and architects that were part of an imperial structure as opposed to those sort of strictly nomadic communities living in the mountains. They had poets, cartographers, polymaths, astronomers. This map on the right is by Mahmoud al-Kashgari, which illustrates the world as it was known, the ecumen. Right? And here you might say, well, it doesn't look much like a world map, but very much like the Long Now clock will look in 10,000 years. It, I promise you, it is. <laughs> this is a map that shows lakes and rivers and the, and the, uh, the Caspian Sea and uh, India and other places. It's actually all labeled up and mapped. These are not folks who were barbaric outsiders, but in fact, at this stage in their, in their development, were beginning to assimilate to a broader model of civilization, one that ex extended at the height of the Silk Road. And we have evidence for it. We have it in the artifacts that we find at Tashbulak. We have, for example, mirrors from the Seljuks and coinage stamped with their own rulers. We know these were their coins. We have uh, inscribed cups and bowls, in this case with Arabic writing, and we have uh, objects like this at our, at our site in Tashbulak, high in the mountains. We also know they were eating pretty well. Look, this is just the list, some work done by my former PhD student, Rob Spengler, who's now in Germany, the list of all the goodies they were eating in the palace. Peaches and melons and grapes. This stuff wasn't growing at 12,000 feet, I promise you. They were importing it, and they were up there, and they were making money selling steel, and they were trading, and they were operating that high mountain Silk Road, just like that fluctuating map, right? Just as an aside, I had been doing some archival research uh, for this whole thing on fruit trade, and I found this wonderful series of photographs at the Library of Congress. 
and you can, they're recolored, right? So they're black and white images that they use this technology to put the color back into. And this is a really amazing one of the, um, could we bring the lights down for just two seconds just to see the look on that man's face if it shows up? All right, now that's the man in 1913 who sells grapes and berries and, and such. And this is my photo in 2003, and I'm pretty sure that's the same guy. <laughs> now, Tosh Bulak itself is a fascinating place, and we're going to continue to work there with your money. So please, <laughs> please let us know when you're ready. Uh, it's like a wedding. I have one of those big, like an Italian wedding. You have like one of those big baskets, and you just put the money in it. Just kidding. Um, I want you to come and participate in an intellectual way, because this city is an important lesson for us. Tosh Bulak did grow up pretty fast, but it only lasted 200 years. And I think it was the hubris of the Karakhanids. They were no, a nomadic polity. They were doing just fine for hundreds of years prior to, that, to that, 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 that creation of a political unity. They started to compete with empires. They started to build cities and settle down and dive into that old model of civilization. And I think it was their downfall. I think they went too far. I think that they stopped being sustainable. They stopped having the kind of connectivity that occurred. Now, the Mongols had something to do with it, but the Mongols, ironically, deposed them. So they were too rigid, too stable, too assimilative, if you will. Now, I'm not fighting against assimilation. What I'm fighting against is the idea here that this nomadic system, which had functioned for already 2,000 or more, or 3,000 years, this connectivity and network and this open ecumen started to lock up. And the Karakhanids, in a sense, played a role in that. And their, their networks froze, and their cities died. So we're coming to the end. Were Eurasian nomads the first futurists? Were they the first communities to actually realize that sustainability and innovation can go hand in hand, provided we balance it with environment and connectivity? Does power have to be rigid? Does power have to be locked up in urban structures and bureaucracies? Or can it be more open source? Can it be something that, in fact, moves and is adaptive and is interoperable and multi-scalar. Today we're confronted with urbanism, population growth, disease, and progress at catastrophic levels. You've all seen Al Gore's pitch. I don't need to convince anyone in this room, I hope, that what we're doing is not sustainable even in our best technological way. This is the city of Mali, on the beautiful tourist island of the Maldives, where I just started a new project looking at the collapse of the Silk Road. This is the most dense per capita, per land area, urban center in the world, I believe, or one of them. Just offshore is the beautiful island of Filafushi. This is where all the garbage from Mali goes. And it's just on fire all the time. Now, when there's storm waters or surges, where do you think all that goes? Visit the Maldives. We don't need to have land. We'll build islands. We'll dredge up the ocean. We'll bleach out the coral. It's not an ecological system, right? No. Right. Yet, and this is really where we put the, the finer point on our perspective of civilization. This is our model of SpaceX. Now, I'm a huge fan of, of, of uh, a lot of the projects that come out of Tesla and out of SpaceX in the sense that I think that they've popularized and made cool the idea of sustainable energy. I think there's a lot of projects there that are amazing. This one gives me pause, because as an individual who's for the last 25 years studied sustainable systems of, no, of mobile nomadic communities and their nonetheless important influence on civilization, this model of growth on a planet which isn't built for us makes me stop and wonder. It makes me wonder whether urbanization is in fact everything we need. It makes me wonder whether the kinds of progress that we see it as being fundamental to our civilization is in fact the only way. And given the world where it is today, I leave that to the long now and everyone here to help figure out but this is my parting image. I was in Indonesia, on the island of Lombok, uh, this past Christmas. And I spent that Christmas, or that New Year, in a village uh, called Gunggung, sorry, Gunggung Sitoli. 
And that village had this young girl living in it. And every day we would walk up this hill to our little bungalow, which we rented on Airbnb. <laughs> and this young girl would be collecting clay from backyard. And what she was making were little models of her ideal world. And here you see her house. It's two stories with a little shelter on top. You got some babies, you got the family. And we said, what is this? And she said, this is my future. Her future is, is something that's very sustainable, very realistic, very rooted in the very, in, in the exact things that I think challenge us as highly developed, highly computerized, highly progressive societies. Now, I'm not expecting anyone here to go move to a village in Indonesia. It would probably ruin it. But we do need to understand that there are reversals to the utopian vision that we have to our world. There's dystopia as well. And when I left this village, this seemed like a utopia. Thank you. There you go. Let's have a seat. <laughs> Question that Kevin put on top is you've not mentioned water very much. How does that fit into all this? Um, Speaking of something here, have some. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in terms of like the day to day life in terms of water or the overarching um, kind of framework of water? Yeah, the day-to-day -day and sort of the where the folks are and where they're not. Yeah. Um, so these the pastoralist systems, of course, all, you know, all human habitations and, and adaptations that rely on having you know, drinkable water, both for mm -hmm. themselves and their animals. And what's unique about the Eurasian steppes, and especially these mountain zones, is in fact they're very well watered. They get up to 1,000 millimeters of rainfall at elevation. Mm -hmm. When you go down in elevation, you can range from these really, really dry deserts up to you know, basically well-fed, uh, rain-fed rain, rain uh, foothills. So it's a question of understanding the nuanced mosaic and the niches that are created within the scope of these environments. And, and some of the most desolate environments, whether it's the Sahara or the open deserts of Central Asia or lots of other uh, regions, folks who live there and who know that eco ecology can figure out how to find drink, you know, drinkable water at a certain scale. Mm -hmm. There's not enough water probably to sustain major cities. And that's, I think, one of the big differences between major hydraulic, hydraulic systems like the Yellow River or Meso you know, mm -hmm. the Tigris and Euphrates, the Nile. Those river systems allowed for that kind of expansive growth. Here you have smaller rivers, you've got a kind of a very different set of hydraulic conditions that in a way stilted that otherwise, that sort of alternative model, or the, the, the main model that we know. And it kind of led way for this alternative way. So later when the caravans are coming along these sheep forged pathways, um, they're finding water uh, enough to not have to carry a lot of water? Well, that's why that, I think the tracks are following through the foothills, because mm -hmm. there's plenty of water in the foothills. Um, okay. It's really when you get out into the plains that it gets to be pretty sketchy. So then you get out into the desert plains, and then you've got to make a beeline between water source to water source, mm -hmm. which there are, but it's much easier to pass through the foothills where you're getting, especially in the summer. In the wintertime, you know, I, would, I, I imagine the travel along the Silk Road in the wintertime was, was fairly... Um, Limited. I mean, it's so really it's a cold. seasonal use of these pathways. Mm -hmm. I, I, what I, was the I season? Think the when were, when was, was the road new? I would say, you know, if you, take, if you just take an environmental perspective, the, the high passes open up around May to June. So you mm -hmm. only have a few months in the high passes. Again, you need navigators. And so mm -hmm. who are the folks that best know the mountains? This was part of the logic behind the model in and of itself. You know, if you were going to go wander across the Rocky Mountains, you'd try to find yourself, find yourself a mountain person to take you over the mountains. These mountain folks have been living there for 4,000 years. They know mm -hmm. the ways through the mountains. So, so it's not like surprising. a hired guide? That's part of their... No, I, I think it's more of a participatory arena. I think that mm -hmm. the notion that, you know, you don't have caravans that like leave Xi'an and end up in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. These are uh, objects and items and packages that are being passed along. And every time you cross into a territory, we actually have historical records of this going back, you know, quite far into, into, the, uh, into the written record, where caravans would come into a new valley or a new pass and they'd be met by horse riders or by individuals, you know, nomadic individuals who would say, this is the land of, you know, Stuart Khan, and he wants tribute. Um, I mean, you wouldn't believe what I had to pay to get here. Uh, uh, so this tribute 
this tribute would be paid to those rulers, mm -hmm. and that would come in the form of commodities, it'd come in the form of trade objects, hmm. et cetera. So the caravanners would plan within their, within their uh, sort of packaging, mm -hmm. say, okay, we're gonna lose 20% along the way, as terms of tribute, in terms of passage, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And that would be what, some of the ways in which these objects would flow uh, in different directions. So how do the caravanseries work? What was that system? Caravanseries are an incredibly fascinating architectural reality. They're basically hotels for caravanners, right? Mm -hmm. So you have spaces for the animals to be watered. They're usually in very rich or you know, well-watered environments where you have a good resting spot. They're also social networks, right? I mean, mm -hmm. there's a wonderful piece of research by one of my, uh, a, a young scholar named uh, Kate Franklin, who's at the University of Chicago, and she studies caravans around, around the Silk Road. And her work has illustrated that the caravans themselves were kind of generating this like notion of what it was to be um, uh, cultured, if you will. Mm -hmm. So they created cosmologies of what you needed to have if you were moving along the Silk Road. And so I think that these caravanserais functioned as much as functional hotels and stopping points, as, much, as well as real conveyors of the notion of connectivity and the notion of culture that was that, of the populations that lived there. How many different cultures are intersecting in these places? Oh, I don't know. Like, I mean, the again, two or three depends. local ones, or I mean, I don't know that, that. I. I, mean, I, pr I can't really necessarily answer mm -hmm. that. I mean, I think it depends on where you are. You know, mm -hmm. what segments of the Silk Road. It's such a diversified network. Mm -hmm. I think there were areas that were much more homogenized in the sense that there were strong, you know, boundaries of leadership, etc. Mm -hmm. But the the key is that you know these were multilingual, multi-religious. I mean, if you think about just religions alone. Uh, at least three or four major religions were fun were flowing across the Silk Road at any given mm -hmm. time. You have Buddhism, Islam, Islam Christianity. Um, and Zoroastrianism, mm -hmm. and I'm sure I'm missing others, Hinduism. So these are all five, minimum, world religions. Right? Not to mention shamanists and Sufis and other sects and populations that were within those religions. So you know, that's just one source of diversity. So you have language and religion and ethnicity and all these things. And if we look at these populations genetically, mm -hmm. um, Central Asians, I mean, uh, from the modern genome, these are some of the most admixed populations on the planet. Hmm. So from a genetic perspective as well, you get this, you know, in the modern in the modern population, one of the most admixed communities from a genetic perspective. So it makes sense that this format of interaction, this open kind of system, was 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 moving around a lot of things. So this, some of the stuff that's flowing is really valuable. I mean, it's the Silk Road because yeah. silk is something that's yeah. worth transporting a long distance, and, and high carbon steel and things like that. Wherever there's value, there's usually theft. How did that play <laughs> out? Um, you know, there's, there's writings about this. The, the Chinese, of course, uh, love to portray the, the treachery of, of their trade partnerships. Um, you know, I, my, sense, my sense of, the, of, the, of that side of it is, you know, it's really what we're talking about is piracy in a sense, right? I mean, to the extent that commodities are open, it's really about who you know rather than what you know. Hmm. So if you have networks that are secure, you might actually strategize to only have a short segment. So you would bring your, your wares only a short segment across those social networks that you know of. Mm -hmm. And this is something that also functioned, for example, in the Mediterranean. Uh, sea traders would go between ports where they had specific, oftentimes family kin, or, mm -hmm. you know, like for example, the Berbers, they had these wonderful trade networks that would allow for trust within the mm -hmm. trade system. And I think the Silk Road functioned very much in the same way. But, you know, unlike uh, some of the trade networks, say, in, in historical periods in, in Europe, we don't have as many um, clear documents. I mean, one of the best books on this topic is by a woman named Valerie, um, oh, I'm forgetting her last name. Anyway, I apologize. Yeah. Uh, Kim Kelly has a specific question. You have all this Tosh block, amazing discovery. And um, he was wondering if there was any memory in the locals there of, of any of that story, or were they just astounded to find an ancient city in their fields? Yeah, I mean, the, the past, so, so there's a couple of interesting modern aspects to Tosh block. One is it's actually a, a military zone. So no one has lived there since at least the start of the Soviet era, hmm. uh, except for nomads who can rent from the state. Uh, plots or areas of pasture, so you'll get nomadic communities living up there and kind of putting up their tents in the summer. It's also high elevation, so you, it's only open for a couple of months of summer, otherwise it's buried in snow. Mm -hmm. The nomads today who operate up there, they call it the hollow, hollow hill, because when you stomp on the, on the citadel, it kind of rings because it's mostly just rocks, and so you, you know, it, it, it kind of uh, feels like there's something weird. But when we started to sort of open it up as an archaeological site, they, they had no idea that this was something that was there. But again, they're pretty busy. So, you know, they're like, oh, interesting. And then they kind of keep moving. <laughs> I, you know, I try to get them to dig for free, but they don't want to do it. I got a couple of questions on uh, nomads. One of them from Nick is, is there any evidence of nomadic people making chairs? 
Chairs? Chairs. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Say more. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, they, they make saddles too, right? Mm -hmm. So their saddles actually oftentimes have stands. Mm -hmm. So you oftentimes see, for example, um, images of like, you know, uh, Mongolian rulers and things sort of mm -hmm. sitting in these stools. They're not chairs in the same exact sense that we think mm -hmm. of them as like throne chairs and that kind of thing. But I mean, in a lot of ways, you know, their contact with so many other communities, both Persians and, and um, Chinese, definitely had them at least having things, that, you know, furniture. Furniture mm -hmm. is definitely not something that was, that was uh, foreign to them. But I will, there's an interesting point to be made about chairs. If you look at the relief in, per in Persepolis, which is the uh, first millennium BC capital of the Achaemenid Empire, which is a Persianate empire, mm -hmm. they had this beautiful panel, large scale panel on the wall carved in stone. And it shows all of the attendances, all the attendees to sort of a procession to the king of the Achaemenids. And so the king is sitting there and he's in a throne. And everybody else is standing. And the Scythians, the Saka in this case, but they're Scythians basically, they're standing and they have their horses, but none of them are ever sitting. So there is this sort of association with the seated posture as being one of power and, and, uh, and royalty, which I don't ah. see so often. Usually they're mounted, the, the, the images of Scythians. Stephen Howard has a kind of complicated set of questions about the open ecumen and, and nomads. Um, I'm wondering how this is playing out in the present in the near future as we're getting denser and denser, basically, living situations for most of humanity. You know, are we nomadic in any sense like this now, and what's the future of nomads? Now, the nomads you've been talking about so far are herders. Yeah. You know, they got animals. Yeah. And they're going up and down with the seasons, and that's uh, a, a very specific form of nomad. There's lots of other people that travel. Sure. <laughs> Um, so I have an interesting analogy for this, and I, I apologize if this may, if this may be um, anachronistic or something. So one of my interesting sort of observations, or interesting to me anyway, one of my sort of uh, moments of sort of aha was when I realized that you're looking out at a, at a nomadic herd, and you do the calculation, and let's say there's a herdsman or a herding family, and they've got 3,000 sheep, and each sheep is worth actually more, but let's just say for argument's sake, $100. Mm -hmm. Every year they return on that, what is that, 300,000, 3 million? I don't know, you guys are the math people. <laughs> it's a lot of money, and it returns at about 20%, and this is a stock, mm -hmm. right? So they have animal stock, mm -hmm. and that stock is what allows them to kind of have this flexibility. They say, you know what, I don't need to pay you taxes, I'm gonna move my animals and go. Okay, so here's coming back to your question about the modern nomad. Mm -hmm. What are the ways in which today, digital nomads and communities for whom uh, earning your money isn't necessarily linked to exactly where you live? Mm -hmm. Is it stock? Mm -hmm. Is it the ability to sort of navigate networks and earn money through remote and uh, mobile systems? I think they're not that different. The difference, of course, lies in- A little in, less in, seasonal, maybe. A little less seasonal, right, exactly. Oh, no, who knows? People do, do go on vacation from like November <laughs> till January. Um, <laughs> But there is a, a point of difference that's, that's significant, and that is kinship. So these systems, the, the you know, uh, traditional nomadic systems, nomadic pastoralists, what allows them that security and, and re risk reduction is kinship. So if you lose your herds in a snowstorm or if you get a big disease, your family will bail you out. Mm -hmm. Now, that happens here in Silicon Valley, I understand, too, but in a different way. I'm talking about systematic kinship that actually enables for systems to grow. And I think that today, you know, the, the movement towards mobile networks and mobile nomads, that kind of thing, and the whole uh, digital nomad environment is one that really demands a reformation of social networks. And so we need to kind of find social kinships that facilitate that kind of mobility such that we're not just, you know, it's not just a dog-eat-dog -dog world. That, that's maybe my vision of it. But again, I, I live in a slightly different world than you. So you mentioned that there was this period, kind of a golden age of the, this part of the Silk Road, where the tribes kind of got together, stopped fighting, and collaborated. Um, how did, what do you think that was going on there? You know, I think there's a couple of things. So the, what I didn't mention about the Karakhan, it's another key point about that sort of uh, confederacy, is that that was also the time when um, there was a rise in very important empires out on their fringes, the Song Dynasty in China, as well as uh, the Arabic Caliphate, the first, the, the Abbasid Caliphate. So it was organized at both ends. So these, these two groups were putting enormous pressure. Mm -hmm. And there were, there were emissaries. We have historical documents, for example, from the, the Khitans, sort of the, 
the polity in the north to the Song, who would send emissaries into the, 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 the Turkic nomadic region and say, we want to participate, we want to, you know, we want to trade with you guys. And um, these emissaries made, made their way all the way down to the, to the fringes of Iran, where you had Islamic the fringes of the, of the Abbasid Caliphate. And they said they would respond by thinking, no, you're infidels, so we're not going to trade with you. Mm -hmm. So the Karakhanis did something very interesting. Now, I can't say what their motivations were, but in the Heart, the center part of the, the middle part of the 10th century, they as a state decision convert to Islam, and there, that conversion opens up and changes the face of the Silk Road for a very long period of time. So they're systematically participating in uh, currents of ideology, currents of trade, etc. And of course, aspects and parts of Western China were part of their their empire. So it wasn't this, the modern day border of China, and so the Song Dynasty was quite small. And the Karakhanids, in fact, enveloped an enormous part of what is essentially Western China. And mm -hmm. that participation in these broader networks, I think, is what fundamentally allowed them to sort of compete with and participate with what were essentially imperial forces on, on all their fringes. Mm -hmm. And so it almost seems like a certain degree of, of pressure that mm -hmm. took them from what maybe it was a more disarticulated open ecumen model into something that was more of a sort of axial model of, of real em imperial uh, conflict and imperial kind of boundedness. The question from Shane Becker, talking about these various imperial states and so on, and, and, and very um, urbanized and organized empires, many of which failed at various points. Yeah. But you've also pointed out that at various points the, there was a hiatus in traffic along the Silk Road, and in a sense it failed at various yeah. points. What was that about? Well, um, so this is actually a, big, a major question of my current research. Um, my short answer is I don't know, and I don't know that we necessarily know. Um, the argument that I've heard, or I mean, one of them, that, some of them that I've read about, is that there's a sort of competitive rise in the 16th century of maritime trade and other kinds of things. But um, knowing what I know about the archaeology of Central Asia and the durability of these systems, mm -hmm. in, even in light of sort of the Mongolian kind of transformation and everything else, it strikes me that this system, uh, the Silk Road, should have been much more adaptive and, and much more resilient. Now, it, it was really was resilient for roughly 4,000 years, mm -hmm. even if, even 3,000 or 2,000. That's still pretty impressive. And so that resiliency had to go through some fundamental change. And mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it's interesting to see that something about that that network begins to break down. I think it must have something to do, though, with the rigidity of boundaries, because the Silk Road functioned wholeheartedly as an open system. And that I think that was really its key. So something in that historical period, whether it was the rise of Timur and the Timurid state, um, something going on with China. I mean, you also have this is also the you know the well into the um, you know, the post Tang and other phases. I mean, you have lots of sort of dynastic developments throughout East Asia and South Asia that I think really constrict the flows that otherwise enabled the Silk Road and its predecessor and its sort of precursor for thousands of years. So is it the fact that we learn how to sail around, around the Horn of Africa, or is mm -hmm. it something internal? That's actually a question I'm still asking. A couple questions about sort of your practice out there. Liz uh, Boiler asks, uh, what prompted and sustained your interest from 20 years ago in Central Asia and nomadic networks? And another question, without a name, says, uh, how are you greeted by the local population? Do they welcome this work? Do they feel you'd be a boon to their culture? Do you put them back in history? Are they interested in what you're doing? Sure. Um, my, you know, my, my initial uh, foray into Central Asia was really opportunistic, um, both in sort of positive and in somewhat sort of tragic ways. Um, you know, I'm a sort of child of the 90s or the 80s and 90s, and so I was in college in the early 90s when the Berlin Wall fell, and mm -hmm. you know, 96, all of a sudden there was no Soviet oh, Union anymore. Yeah. And so, like a lot, so many people, I was fascinated by this region that we had just not known about. You know, there's this big gap in our world. Mm -hmm. And I was 22 and pretty dumb, and I'm still dumb, but I'm just not 22 anymore. And uh, I just wanted to go to that part of the world, and I had an opportunity to do research. I had started my work in Africa, so I was working with nomadic You're groups. You were an archaeologist at Yeah, this point. I mean, I was already, I got into it in, in undergrad by a really mm -hmm. wonderful professor who kind of stimulated me into the field. I was an engineering student, actually. Uh, I did my undergraduate it almost. Shows. Yeah, I used a lot of the engineering in the end as an archaeological, mm -hmm. as an archaeologist, but he got me into this, sort of this social thinking and yeah, one thing led to the next, and I was able to sort of enter into Kazakhstan at a time, you know, 99, 1998, when nobody, nobody was there, 99. And then the tragic side of it actually was 9-11. So, you know, 9-11, two years later, happens. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden, everyone wants to know what's going on in Central Asia. 
Hmm. And what's going on with nomads? And what's Afghanistan? And what are these places? And here I was about to finish my PhD as an individual who had lived in Central Asia for three years, spoke some of the languages, and all of a sudden I was like, uh, I know. Hmm. And you know, that was really opportunistic. The people in Central Asia themselves are amazing. Some of my very, very closest friends are, in fact, Kazakhs uh, mm -hmm. and Uzbeks. That gentleman you saw in the video, Farhad, I mean, like a brother to me. You know, working there for 20 years, you realize that we've got a really sort of limited, we, I mean, myself included, everyone has a very limited way of understanding the world. I think that's one of the beauty, beauties about this community and about the Long Now group. I mean, so interested in having a wider perspective on what the world is about. These folks are the same. You know, they want their kids to go to college, and they want all the kinds of things. Mm -hmm. They're coming out of a tough post-Soviet environment, but which is now already 30 years ago. I mean, it's not like they can, you know, this is a whole generation ago. Are they still herding? Absolutely. Uh, really? you know, we were just talking about Sheep this. Sheep and with, goats. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, the, 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 the baseline practices mm -hmm. are still very similar. I mean, you know, the site of Bigash, less than a kilometer away, is a small, moder is a contemporary herding village. I mean, mm -hmm. they're living in the exact same places. Um, the people were, are very interested in what we're doing. There's local archaeologists. You know, the Soviet tradition of archaeology was in place, and we have got, mm -hmm. we've got great collaborators. The Kazakh government is extremely supportive. Uh, I've given lectures at the embassy and done sort of, you know, galas and all sorts of things for, for, for the Kazakh uh, political side of things as well. I, I think it's important because we're really now, in a sense, I'm a, I'm a voice, one of the voices for, an, for a, 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 a heritage that isn't my own, right? So if I'm going to speak for another population and, in a sense, promote them, uh, I should clearly be interacting with them and also including them in that process. And so we're very, very interactive in terms of how we publish and how we work and all of our artifacts and everything stays in country. And we work uh, very closely with the national governments to make sure that there's Are there a local outlet. museums coming up it, around all this. Well, I mean, they've had museums since the Soviet era, so mm -hmm. I mean, their museum, uh -huh. mm -hmm. their museum structure is very well developed. In some cases, even more organized than what we have here. So you know, yeah. at the state level. Um, so, yeah, I mean, they, they've got it all sorted out. Uh, they don't need us, per se, but what happened in the, in the 90s and in the early 2000s was just this kind of fascination with different methods and different ways of thinking, and it's really produced a very uh, productive uh, collaboration. So I think a lot of people here are wondering uh, what's involved in becoming a tourist in this area. Can you, can you hike? Can you ride? <laughs> you can, is it easy to get there? Are you Absolutely. welcome? Are there places to stay? Uh, Absolutely. What's um, the deal? <clears throat> Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan in particular are extremely easy. They're visa-free. Um, they've got modern airports, they fly to Europe, multiple, you know, every other day you can get a flight from London, Germany, Amsterdam, Paris, whatever. Um, very easy to get to, and the people are just amazing. You know, one of the key trends in Central Asian culture is hospitality. Hmm. Um, I've been fed by families, you know, who, you know, were camping and didn't have anything with them or what have you, and I'm hiking through the mountains, and they bring you into their house. You may or may not be able to speak their language. They sit you down, and whatever they they have, it's on the table. I mean, mm -hmm. imagine walking down the street and having some foreigner kind of pass us by, and just because you say, "Come on into my house, I'm going to feed you." I mean, how many people have done that? <laughs> Seriously, like we never do that, and. That's sad, right? I mean, like, this is a world in which I've been invited into people's homes so much mm -hmm. that they end up being lifelong friends. And these are folks who are herders and, you know, whatever. It's, it's an amazing culture. And, and as tourists, you can access that quite easily. Um, other countries have slightly stricter visa laws, but for the most part, you're not going to find a lot of danger or a lot of uh, risk in those places, as I see it. So what's um, the landscape like? Is this, you know, I saw mountains, yeah. I saw steps. And it's a lot like here, you know, you have, it's less, it's less, um, it's less lush in terms of the, the forested areas. They don't have such large areas of forest, but the mountain areas are gorgeous. Like I said, very high peaks. The Tian Shan Mountains go up to 7,000 meters. Mm -hmm. So really world-class climbing and skiing. They've got downhill skiing. I mean, Kazakhstan's a modern country. And mm -hmm. it, it's absolutely modernized. Um, in spite of having vast open territory. It's 15 million people for a country that's two-thirds the size of this of the United States. So that's a very low population density. Uh, Is it practical for some maniac to um, decide to, they, they want to hike? The, they want to do the Silk Road 4,700 miles. Which direction should they go, and is it even plausible? <laughs> well, if you, if you believe in my map, it's absolutely impossible because it's all over the place. Uh, no, but if you took like a, gen a general arc, right, and you wanted to go city to city, like all the big, mm -hmm. you know, the kind of the old way we understood the Silk Road is mm -hmm. these kind of big city stops, the main urban oasis cities. Mm -hmm. um, I would say start in Uzbekistan. You know, Uzbekistan gives you the initial flair of 
you know, it's a bit more exotic. It's all, it's all the things that you're going to hope for. Mm -hmm. Kazakhstan's a modern country. You get to Almaty, which is essentially a medieval city, and it looks like, you know, any major modern metropolis. You have mm -hmm. to kind of get off the beaten track to see some of the monuments. Uzbekistan has the blue domes and the tile and a lot of that kind of, you know, really iconic. And then, of course, that's staged. A lot of it's re rebuilt by UNESCO and a lot of it's, it's built up as, a, as part of the, the, the heritage of the Silk Road. In mm, which direction do you go? I would, so the way I did it, so I've hiked most of it. Not hiked the whole thing, but, you know, donkey, hike, car, mm -hmm. drag behind, all sorts of different things. Mm -hmm. We started, I started, I did two tracks. I started in Almaty and went over the Kyrgyz Mountains on foot mm -hmm. and then down into China, mm -hmm. into Kashgar, and then around the southern desert, which is just an amazing panorama. If I ever had the opportunity just to do a photo lecture, it's just one of the most stunning places on the planet, and you just cross over this whole zone. Western China is a bit tougher now. Um, China's become much more restricted in terms of passage. Mm -hmm. This was in the early 2000s, so it was... You is China just, celebrating the Silk Road? Oh, yeah. I mean, right How now, so? China has this program right now, which I think is really important for us to understand from a modern perspective, but also a, a historical one. They've drawn on the Silk Road as a, as a model uh, to develop a multi-trillion dollar program called One Belt, One Way. And One Belt, One Way is Xi Jinping's like, big pioneer project now to connect China to the West vis-a-vis -vis the Eurasian step. And they're and China's going to pay for that. China's paying for it. They're paving roads in Tajikistan. They're, they're helping with development in Kazakhstan. You know, they've just built this huge connect, connection point uh, in Horgos, which is a city on the border between China and Kazakhstan, where the tracks, you know, because the Chinese have different rails than, than the Kazakhs, where they, have, they up, offload all the stuff. I mean, it's a very, very high-tech, uh, modern image in, of, of the Silk Road. And it's, they're literally using the historical model of this imperial connectivity of the Silk Road to justify and lay out the One Belt, One, Ra one Way initiative. Now, on the one hand, you might say, great, more global markets, it helps everybody, why not use that, yeah, that trope? And that's okay, I, I'm not an economist, I'm not necessarily here to, co to condemn that, pro that program, but it is important to recognize that that's not how the Silk Road actually functioned. Mm -hmm. right? It wasn't One Belt, One Road. Mm -hmm. It was thousands of belts and thousands of roads with this localized, you know, systemic, these localized systemics. And if we lock it in, and we border it, and we bound it, and we bureaucratize it, I don't think it's going to function the way it did in antiquity. And maybe that's just, again, my sort of reticence to buy in wholeheartedly to a very specific form of, of civilization. Central mm -hmm. Asia offers us a, a different model when we carve underground. And mm -hmm. I think it bears to kind of pay attention to that. It's a long, great, strange story you've told here. This is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.